Thanks, everyone, for joining us today. I'm really delighted uh, to welcome Jack uh, Watling to talk with us today about his tremendous research. He's a global fellow with the Wilson Center's Global Europe Program. Uh, he is a senior research fellow for land warfare uh, at the Royal United Services Institute. Um, his work uh, is closely aligned with the British military on the development of concepts of operation and assessments of the future operating environment. Uh, and uh, he also conducts operational analysis of contemporary conflicts. Uh, so I'm, I'm delighted to join uh, Jack here today uh, to discuss some of his latest work. It's great to be with you, Spencer. Well, thanks so much. Um, so, Jack, you and Justin Bronk have completed a very thorough analysis of unmanned aerial vehicles, or UAVs as folks know them. Uh, some people call them drones. Maybe you could talk a little bit about some of the differences in terminology. But could you tell us why this analysis is important at this particular time, uh, especially given all of the talk on, on ammunition and other things that artillery that United uh, that United States is being asked to give that others are being asked to give to Ukraine. Why is this topic so important right now? So I think, as you just indicated, the priorities for supporting Ukraine remain quite traditional platforms, artillery ammunition being the highest priority. But the area where the Ukrainians themselves have driven forward, innovated, developed the most sophisticated tactics is in the space of UAVs. And those observing the conflict in Ukraine have seen the very substantial impact they have had on the battlefield in terms of ISR, uh, the transparency of the front, and also in terms of the kinetic effects that those UAVs are delivering, both against tactical and operational targets. The problem is that while we see a lot of these videos of UAVs going into targets, uh, people don't necessarily understand what happens at the back end. They don't necessarily understand the adaptations that need to be made to the UAVs to keep them effective. And so if we are to learn the lessons for ourselves, if Western militaries are to bring UAVs into our own forces in an optimal way, it's important that we understand that wider picture of the context of their employment, how they're used most effectively, and where the mistakes are. And the Ukrainians have learned mistakes to their cost. You know, they have, they've moved through them, they've adapted and improved, but we need to jump that journey. And so the purpose of the report is to take the experience that we've had in Ukraine of seeing U Ukrainian UAVs, Russian UAVs, Western UAVs that have been provided to the Ukrainians all operating in a real live combat environment and ensure that our militaries can learn from that and learn the, learn the right lessons. Thank you. So how did you lock in on this topic uh, in the first place, and how much of your analysis is based on uh, your on-the-ground experience in Ukraine? And maybe while you're answering that, you can talk about what some of that um, experience has been uh, on the ground there. So the, the cover photo of this report was a picture that I took in uh, June of 2022, um, and we were with a Ukrainian reconnaissance patrol. It was an experimental UAV at the time that was being flown over Russian positions to see whether we could get the navigation system to be resilient against electronic warfare. Um, and from then forward, we have been working with the Ukrainians extensively, going to their training facilities where they're preparing their pilots, observing UAV operations, and also doing technical exploitation, so taking apart the Russian UAVs that have been hitting targets inside Ukraine. Um, and so the report is based on both data held by the Ukrainian general staff, uh, experimentation that has been conducted outside of Ukraine that we've observed by a number of countries, um, and also the observation of tactics and operations being conducted in Ukraine. Very often debr debriefing brigade commanders, for example, about how they actually use their UAVs and having those conversations throughout the conflict so that we can see how employment has changed as people have become more adept at using these systems. And when you say we, uh, who are you there with? Were you independent? Were you attached to an organization or a government? So the Royal United Services Institute is an independent research body uh, and has been spending time with the Ukrainians throughout the conflict. Uh, it's myself, my colleague Nick Reynolds, and Justin Bronk, my co-author of this report, uh, who have been going into country and building these relationships as academics. I mean, that's our, that's our role. Yeah. Right. So 
Do you think that these precision strike weapons will render established systems obsolete uh, in, in the future? And if so, is this something we need to worry about? Uh, or is this a natural progression that you think is, is all positive? So I think if you want to see what uh, a fight looks like when you haven't adapted to the threat that these things pose, uh, look at the war in Nagorno-Karabakh that happened in 2020, where the Armenians had very few answers to this threat and were therefore pulled apart, right? Mm. If you don't prepare for it, it will go very badly wrong for you. Um, if you understand the threat and you adapt and you have tactics, capabilities in place to deal with it and you have the capabilities yourself, then it's usually less about replacing or rendering obsolete existing platforms than being a force multiplier for them. Um, it, UAVs tend to complement artillery, for example. They tend to complement your standoff ISR using electronic warfare and other things by allowing you to positively identify what you're detecting. Um, it prevents you falling for deception, for example. Uh, and so it's a complementary capability most of the time. However, it also changes the balance of missions and therefore the requirements and the priorities for some of those legacy platforms. For example, it's much more effective to go hunting enemy artillery using counter-battery fire with UAVs than it is to just use radar to do detection of incoming rounds and then retaliation. Those radar have to be active, they have to emit, they're very vulnerable themselves, and they tend to be attrited very quickly. If you send UAVs after uh, a, an enemy artillery piece, you can hit it even when it starts trying to displace. So you obviate the effectiveness of shoot and scoot tactics, for example. But that means that our own artillery are no longer fixed in that counter-battery fight. And so that changes the balance of missions between them, the density of systems that you might need to have in a formation. Um, so it definitely changes and displaces things. But we shouldn't see it as existing platforms being taken out of the line and UAVs coming in in their place. Of course, where you start facing trade-off decisions is when you have a limited budget, a limited number of people. Do you take the UAVs or do you take something else? And that depends on the tactics that a formation has developed in terms of which balance of capabilities it needs. There are some things that a commander under many situations might choose to take the UAVs forward rather than a legacy platform. For those who are watching who are new to this topic, is there any difference between a drone and a UAV uh, in, in terms of, of how we think about this? Uh, so drone and UAV, I think, is synonymous, un uncrewed aerial vehicle. People often talk about uncrewed aerial systems, and what they mean by that is obviously the, the thing that flies plus the enablers, the pilot, the ground control station, the communication relay that allows that to work. It's a system. Um, the problem that we have with drone as a term, and in fact with UAVs as well, is that, of course, that covers everything from a $400 toy all the way up to a $150 million uh, long-range reconnaissance vehicle that is the size of a, you know, intermediate airliner. Um, and those things are radically different, both in terms of tactics, where they're useful, you know, what you can do with them. Um, and what we tend to see in the debate around UAVs in terms of where they fit in the force is that people start with the efficiency of a $400 toy and then they just casually add more and more capability onto it and what they're describing. But they don't also update their assessment of cost, complexity, uh, and what it takes to use it. And I think that's where we end up in a dangerous space because we have a vision in our head that these things are cheap, ubiquitous, disposable. But what we're demanding of them is something that will probably cost you tens or even hundreds of thousands of dollars. We need to be very disciplined, therefore, about how we break up the term drone into meaningful categories. And in terms of the capacity within the UAV space of Ukraine versus Russia, uh, maybe give us some broad strokes of you know how how uh, comparable those capabilities are, and in terms of you know those in Ukraine trained to use them, you know versus uh, Russia, are they on? Is that on par? I would say that there is a very radically different approach between Ukraine and Russia in solving a very consistent problem, which is how do you continue to update and adapt the system mm -hmm. to make sure it's effective in a, a, an environment where the defenses are always trying to catch up. The Ukrainian approach is to have hundreds of domestic companies that are all innovating rapidly 
uh, and developing a diverse array of systems, some of which work, some of which don't end up working. Um, and it does mean that the Ukrainians can get around a lot of the problems that Russian systems pose against them because they, they usually have a tool somewhere in the arsenal that can work. The problem for the Ukrainians is that when they come up with a solution, they test it in combat. The Russians then start developing countermeasures before the Ukrainians are able to scale production. And so the Ukrainians, have a, they are more adaptable than the Russians in terms of speed, but they struggle with scale. The Russian approach is very centralized. They have scientific technical institutes that study uh, the operational problem. They come up with technical solutions to overcome Ukrainian defenses, and they roll out their solution at scale. Um, and so it's much more centrally driven. It is slower. What they come up with usually works. And so you see this kind of sine wave of effectiveness in the Russian strike system where when they adapt, it becomes very significantly more effective, and then it, it's curtailed until the Russians adapt again. Um, the challenge for the Ukrainians is that the Russian system does allow them to prosecute these strikes at a scale that Ukraine struggles to match. In, in a related area, how quickly does software and hardware for UAVs need to be adapted uh, in the war in Ukraine? And you Maybe you could tell us a little bit about how well that's being done. Uh, so... Generally speaking, you have like a two week grace period of where you have optimal efficiency of a system. You will then start finding that the enemy electronic warfare kind of starts to dial in um, and their countermeasures to the control frequencies become problematic. That is exacerbated over about a six week period. You can often extend the performance life of the platform by changing the software, the behavioral logic what it does when it is being jammed, for example. Once the Russians know how it's gonna behave under jamming, they can start gaming that. So if the platform lands when it loses contact with a base station, um, tries to return to where it took off from, then they will displace the navigation so that it lands on the Russian side of the lines, for example. So you can change the software and that will extend the life of the platform. Um, but once the Russians have shot one down, and it technically exploited it, and they understand how it works at a hardware level, then they often develop some very hard counters that mean that it's difficult to get the things off the ground in some cases. Um, at that point, you need to swap out hardware, and that's probably a three-month cycle. And so what you are seeing is that increasingly, rather than having specific types of UAV that are a named product, you have an airframe, Inside that airframe, you have subsystems of antenna, radio, power pack, processing unit, sensors. Um, and those things are modular. Those things are being updated and changed all the time, which is a critical component of maintaining the efficiency and the effectiveness of the system and its reliability. The, the challenge, I think, for us is that our procurement systems outside of Ukraine are not very favorable to that sort of rapid iteration of a platform not least just from a, a regulatory and safety point of view. So uh, that's one of those areas where we need to think very carefully about how we set up the procurement programs to equip our own forces. It all sounds very complicated and requiring very high level of uh, technical sophistication. Wondering how well is Ukraine and how well are you know, other NATO you know, countries, for example, ally countries doing in producing you know, folks who are trained to be able to do this kind of work? Uh, are, we, are we behind the curve in terms of having uh, experts who are really understanding what's at, uh, what's at stake and how to keep these systems uh, moving in an optimal way? Ukraine's in a fairly, a very different position to us because they've mobilized their civilian population. And so they have their software engineers, they have their you know, technical personnel, who are now in uniform in a lot of cases and are distributed throughout the force. And so given that Ukraine had a fairly developed tech sector, there is this expertise in software and other things where actually some of their troops are probably more competent in that space than they are in their military disciplines. Um, and so the Ukrainians are able to have that, that capability to develop and improve these systems in a lot of their formations. For professional militaries that have not mobilized their civilian population, these are skills that are fairly scarce inside the military. Um, and they are skills that the military needs to have. And I think it pushes us towards a position where a lot of UAVs, putting aside 
you know, relatively cheap uh, quadcopters that you might use just for tactical situational awareness. But anything that's longer ranged or, or has a strike function needs to be operated by a community of specialists, by people who genuinely understand how to keep these things running, how to keep them effective, and how to fly them in a really contested environment, understanding how you do flight planning, how you draw upon technical intelligence in terms of uh, air defense laydowns, terrain, meteorology, the electronic spec um, electromagnetic spectrum in terms of where you can and can't fly, uh, and are able to plan their missions using that data. So within our own militaries, I think one of the lessons here is that you do need specialist units that may well parcel out their personnel to support other arms in a combined arms formation, but nonetheless are a cadre of people who have the, the skills necessary to be able to operate these systems. Is the rapid development of generative AI impacting the UAV landscape? Um, it, it is. Uh, it has, I mean, one of the greatest areas is the speed at which you can do planning. So if you get an electromagnetic spectrum survey uh, and you start plotting how you're going to maneuver through that uh, and you layer on the air defenses and all the other things, if you're doing that manually, it probably takes you a couple of hours to plan a mission. Um, and so the latency required to get a UAV over a target becomes fairly, fairly significant. Um, if you have planning tools that can ingest all of that data and produce options for you uh, that are viable, then you can bring the planning cycle down to 20 minutes. Um, that's one area. There's a lot of back-end, not very sexy stuff that's, that's actually far more consequential, I think, than some of the use cases that are usually discussed. Um, and then you have things like uh, resolving some of the terminal guidance issues. So to be honest, you probably don't want to have UAVs that are making their own decisions about what they strike, just roaming the battlefield. Um, they wouldn't be very good at identifying friend or foe. They wouldn't be very good at distinguishing damaged vehicles from operational vehicles a lot of the time. Uh, they're susceptible to decoys and therefore to hard counters. Um, but when you have, for example, a UAV and its terminal dive against a target and it is doing it at a distance and therefore it drops below the horizon, it'll often lose connectivity with the command station precisely at the point where you're trying to guide it onto the target. And if you have object recognition so that you can designate pixels uh, and then it can home in, then once it goes into that terminal dive, the operator no longer needs to do fine adjustment. It will do it itself. That's the kind of thing where you can significantly improve the efficiency of these systems um, through actually not the most complex uh, kind of software uh, updates. Um, but if you're going to start trying to make fully autonomous capability, you're going to introduce a lot of cost and complexity. Um, and that will reduce the scale at which you can employ these systems and potentially their flexibility as well. Let's talk about regulation for just a second. Maybe you could tell us a little bit more about how regulation of UAVs impacts how they're designed or their effectiveness. So if you have a, an aircraft that can fly 400 kilometers, let's say, uh, and has a warhead on it, then if it gets confused as to its location or orientation, um, it could fly in any direction. And that being the case, even if it doesn't have a warhead, you know, it's a pretty serious flight safety risk. It could fly into the, the path of airliners. It could fly over critical infrastructure uh, and just crash, even if it doesn't have explosives on board that, you know, does damage. If it lands on a highway, for example, it could cause a crash. And so given those risks, we have tended to regulate these things as though they are aircraft. Um, what that means, though, is that, you know, aircraft safety standards are extremely rigorous. And so if you're designing and manufacturing a UAV in most NATO countries, you need to convince the local equivalent of the Federal Aviation Authority that this thing passes muster. Mm -hmm. And it's only once you get to that point that defense can then procure it. So you have to bake all of that regulatory process and time uh, into the cost of the eventual platform. It has to pay for itself. Then you start scaling it. Um, and of course, the military then qualifies somebody not as an expert UAV operator, but as a pilot on a regulated system platform, which is fine until you update the system. It behaves differently, at which point the course that the military has and the certification for the pilot is no longer relevant. Um, it's no longer applicable. Uh, 
and you have to rerun the regulatory process to recertify the platform to make sure the updates don't make it dangerous. All of that means that the UAVs that we tend to procure and purchase, far too expensive. And that process means that we cannot be competitive with an adversary in conflict in terms of how quick we need to update these systems. We need to get after that. You know, um, I don't want to be flippant about the flight, flight safety problem because it's a genuine risk. Uh, and we need to come up with good control measures to make sure that we can, on the one hand, rapidly update these platforms, uh, and on the other hand, provide some assurance that we're not putting dangerous objects over people's houses and roads and that kind of thing. Um, but the existing framework will cost us very, very dearly if we enter a conflict because it's just not fast enough and it makes the systems themselves too expensive. And it means that industry has very bad incentives to try and lock in sales of a specific platform rather than keep remaining agile and accepting that they're going to have to sell a rapidly evolving product to the customer. Um, so there's a range of issues there. Some of them are about regulation. Some of them are about legislation um, in terms of, for example, how we allocate spectrum to the military. If you want these things to be, if you, if you want it to be safe to use in a civilian environment, generally speaking, you allocate a very narrow spectrum piece and it will operate within that spectrum. It makes it very easy to jam because and if the hardware is fixed in terms of being optimized within that spectrum, that's not something you can fix easily. As soon as you get into a conflict, you need to use a lot of spectrum in order to be able to avoid the countermeasures. Um, but our regulation tends to prevent that. So you can't train to do that. If you can't train to do it, what happens, and I've seen this on exercises across NATO, is that you build an exercise environment where people can suddenly use more of the spectrum and because they haven't trained the deconfliction methodologies, because it was all according to the rule book before they got into that kind of sandbox, they start knocking out each other's UAVs just from jamming, uh, jamming each other because they're all using the same bits of frequency. It becomes very chaotic. So um, there are problems that we need to get after if we're going to create the right legislative environment, regulatory environment, to have a competitive military capability. Thanks. That's, that was very helpful. Can you describe the different kinds of missions UAVs carry out on the battlefield? And are there different types of UAVs needed for different kinds of missions? Or can you do a lot of different missions with the same UAV? Uh, so, I mean, a UAV is fairly adaptable because, as I say, you can swap out the mission modules. But realistically, there are, there are a range of categories that lead you to quite different payload and airframe shape size uh, designs. Um, the most basic task is just situational awareness, which is making sure that I can look over the hill, making sure that before I get out of a, a hard position, a trench, say, I can understand where the enemy is. Um, those UAVs need to essentially be disposable. They need to be very cheap and they need to be simple to use because you don't dictate when they need to go up. And so you're going to use them in adverse electronic environments. Therefore, you're going to lose them. Um, they're relatively short ranged as well. There's no point making them long ranged because you're adding cost and complexity to something which is a bit like ammunition. Um, we then get into things like longer range ISR where you are trying to find targets over the enemy front lines in order to provide that data for your artillery um, or for other capabilities. Those, they need to sit above the man pad ceiling. Uh, because they need to sit above the man pad ceiling, they uh, need to have air defense system. Yeah, so a man portable air defense right. system, right? Uh, which is, you know, let's say 13, 15,000 feet, that kind of height. Um, they need to have a pretty reasonable amount of endurance because you want them to not only get over what you're looking for, but you'll be able to move around and look for it, which means they need some, some uh, time on target. Uh, they're probably operating not over the horizon, but at a significant distance. So you need a good antenna and a reasonable radio to be able to get the data back. You need a very good inertial navigation system because you want to be confident that when you detect something, you can actually establish the coordinates of its position rather than being 20 meters off, which will cause you to miss if you fire a precision munition at it. Um, and you need a pretty good stabilized set of sensors because you're at a sufficient altitude that if they're not well stabilized, then you won't find anything. Um, you put all of that together and you're probably talking about something that costs around $120,000, $120,000 to $200,000. Uh, 
which is you know, reasonable pricey. Um, if you go above that two hundred thousand dollar mark, what what that probably means, what that usually means, is that you've started hanging more things off it because you want it to be able to do more stuff. Um, but all of a sudden, in order to have the payload of hanging those things off it or the power requirements for those sensors, you start getting a bigger airframe. Second, you start going above that two hundred thousand dollar mark, you tend to be much more vulnerable to dedicated air defense because you have a larger radar cross section. Um, and you also become just a more economical, attractive target. Uh, and so actually, you'll start losing the UAVs much more regularly. Um, another task is strike uh, in a responsive way. So under guidance, which is usually relevant, let's say 30 kilometers sort of range, something like a Lancet 3M, uh, which is a Russian system. That kind of capability to go and hunt enemy artillery um, is is a very useful capability and it complements a lot of traditional capabilities like the example I gave of being able to do counter battery fire in a more dynamic way. Um, and then you have long range strike, right? The ability to go after fixed points that if you were trying to do it with cruise missiles, it would be uneconomical. Mm -hmm. So you want something that's probably between 40 and 80K uh, in terms of cost. Shahid 136 is a very good example of this, uh, the Iranian system. But what it does is it means that you can hold many, many more things at risk that otherwise would be yeah, uneconomical to engage. And that, that displaces a lot of the enemy's logistics system. And then another capability is, is essentially enabling other effects, like electronic attack against enemy air defense radar, for example. The drones, the UAV is not the thing that's going to knock out the radar. But because you can have quite a lot of time on target, you can create absolute havoc for the enemy air defenses which then allows you to get cruise missiles onto those kinds of hardened targets that you want to hit. Um, the requirements for all those UAVs are actually quite different in terms of size, cost, navigational logic, level of autonomy. Um, and so I think we can break down the, the tasks into a number of different categories. So my final question, were there any big takeaways from your analysis that we didn't cover or that you feel are worth uh, so re-emphasizing, and you know, what will you tackle in the next uh, paper in this series? I know there are yeah, more so, coming. I mean, the, the big headlines are basically we need to be able to procure the subsystems in an adaptable way for common UAV airframes uh, rather than buying a platform, which is a fixed product. Um, so we need to change our acquisition system and our regulatory system to enable that kind of rapid update. Uh, we need specialist communities to operate and maintain these systems rather than trying to just distribute them across the entire force. Um, and we also need to be very rigorous in the mission and the task that we allocate to UAVs, how that complements our existing capability, and then to be ruthless in, in cutting away uh, capability, functionality, complexity in the system that is not required for that task. That's how we get a system that is that is efficient and effective. Um, in terms of things we didn't cover, how do you counter these things? How do you defend yourself from them? Uh, and that's the topic for the next paper. So my colleague Justin and I are currently trying to work out, firstly, how you efficiently detect uh, UAVs, how you engage them in a way that means you're not firing things at them that are far more expensive and scarce than the UAVs you're engaging. Um, and then how do you avoid targeting your own UAVs? Because both in Ukraine and Israel at the moment, what we're seeing is that uh, a lot of UAV losses are caused by friendly forces. Well, thank you so much for taking the time today. Uh, that was a fascinating journey through your research, and we look forward to the next papers in this series. Thank you for having me.